Good afternoon. I am Harry Poston, Chairman of the American Statistical Association's Committee for the Filming of Distinguished Statisticians. It is my honor to welcome you to the Pfizer Colloquium of the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut. Today's colloquium is a milestone for our department in that it is our 10th Pfizer Colloquium. The support by Pfizer Central Research for these programs has enabled us to bring to our university the most distinguished scientists in the field of statistics. It has also enabled us to videotape most of these colloquia for the archives of the American Statistical Association. We are most grateful to Pfizer Central Research for their continuing support. Again, because of the importance of today's talk, we are videotaping it for ASA's archives, and I will call upon my colleague, Professor Dipak Day, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Harry. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Herbert Robbins as a speaker for the 10th Pfizer Colloquium. Professor Robbins received his PhD in mathematics from Harvard University in 1938. After graduation, Professor Robbins worked at the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton and New York University. He became nationally known in 1941 as the co-author with Richard Courant of the classic What is Mathematics? In 1942, he joined the U.S. Navy and served until 1946. His interest in probability theory and mathematical statistics began during the war. In 1946, Professor Hoteling invited him to join his department at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. During his six years at Chapel Hill, Professor Robbins made a number of profound contributions to the field of complete convergence, compound decision theory, stochastic approximation, and the sequential design of experiments. After a Guggenheim Fellowship during 1952-53, Robbins moved from Chapel Hill to Columbia University as a professor and chairman of the Department of Mathematical Statistics. Later, he became Higgins Professor from 1974 to 1985. Currently, he is New Jersey Professor of Mathematical Statistics at Rutgers University. In addition, during 1965 to 1968, he was a visiting professor at Minnesota, Purdue, Berkeley, and Michigan. Professor Robbins has published more than 140 papers on a variety of topics in probability and statistics. His most notable contributions include the empirical Bayes methodology, the theory of power one test, the development of methods for sequential estimation, hypothesis testing, and comparative clinical trials. Professor Robbins is a former president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, Reeds Lecturer, World Lecturer, and Neyman Lecturer. He was the recipient of several awards for excellence in research. He is a member of National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Today, he will present the 10th Pfizer Colloquium, and the title of the talk is Origins of Empirical Base. Thank you. As you just heard, I came to Chapel Hill, North Carolina in the fall of 1946 at the invitation of Harold Hotelling, who was setting up a graduate department of statistics there and wanted someone to teach major theory and probability to prospective PhDs. Both Hotelling and I were well aware that I knew next to nothing about the theory and practice of statistics. But he was willing to take the chance that I would soon learn enough to perform my professional duties. Before I arrived in Chapel Hill, I spent some time reading Harold Cromer's new book, Mathematical Methods of Statistics, to prepare for my new career. But even so, I arrived in a state of great ignorance. In my most painful memory, I recall getting up to ask after a visiting lecturer what is this name and Pearson lemma to which you refer? General hilarity in the audience. The great names in statistics then were R.A. Fisher, Jersey Neyman, and Abraham Wald. There had been a philosophical split between Fisher and Neyman over the proper interpretation of confidence intervals. Fisher had, in a casual way, introduced something he called fiducial probability as a substitute for Bayesianism. But he seemed to be the only person who understood just what it was. 
What is the situation now, come to think of it? Naaman was emphatically anti-Bayes and Wald relied mostly on the concepts of admissibility and minimaxity, although he used Bayesian averages of risk functions as a technical device. All three of them were really too busy doing things to worry too much about the philosophical basis of what they were doing. In that respect, the Bayesians excelled because their schema of prior, conditional, and then posterior probability was very neat and convincing as the philosophical basis uh, as on the philosophical level, once one knew how to get one's hands on a prior. But there didn't seem to be any Bayesians in Chapel Hill at the time, and I didn't find it necessary to choose sides in order to legitimize the things I was doing, which were mostly problems in probability theory. I must admit that my mental image of the statistician's role in real life was something like this. Let's say that a patient has a true but unknown blood pressure theta, the value of which one wants to determine accurately so that an appropriate dosage of medicine can be prescribed. One can measure theta by taking an observation x, but for a variety of reasons, x will not be exactly equal to theta, but will vary around it with some probability distribution. For example, x might be assumed to be normally distributed, with mean theta and a rather large variance sigma squared. Now the theory of probability shows that to eliminate the effect of the variance, one can take not one but a series of independent observations, x1, x2, etc., on successive occasions, and perhaps after discarding any seeming outliers, take the average of n such observations as one's estimate of theta. For large n, the estimate obtained in this manner will be almost certain to, be, to come close to the true but unknown value of theta. In my imagination, I pictured a decrepit old billionaire seated in a wheelchair, having his blood pressure taken every hour, with a statistician on hand to prepare successive estimates of theta for the attending physician. Not a very inspiring picture, especially since the statistician could have easily been replaced by a primitive computing machine to perform the averaging. This picture brightened a bit if the statistician happened to be a Bayesian who came with a prior probability distribution of theta. Prior for decrepit old billionaires? Who knows? For then, Instead of just mechanically averaging the observations, the Bayesian statistician would at each stage compute the posterior distribution of theta given the prior and given the observations x1, x2, etc. thus far, and report this posterior distribution, or its mean, let's say, to the physician. Such a procedure was certainly on a higher intellectual level than simple averaging. Moreover, a good Bayesian statistician might expect to be paid almost as much as a good physician because of his ability to select the right prior with which to start the process. Of course, the influence of the prior on the posterior becomes less and less as the number of observations increases. And after a while, the estimate of theta given by the Bayesian would differ very little from that of the non-Bayesian. Now, I grew up during the Great Depression of the 1930s. And when I began to think about statistical inference, the prospect of spending my time making smaller and smaller improvements in the estimate of this imaginary old billionaire's blood pressure didn't have much appeal. Instead, I found it much more interesting to imagine the following situation. Forget about the old billionaire. Suppose that to improve the health of the general public, medical teams go out to take everybody's blood pressure, but only once for each person. Thus, one has a succession, theta one, theta two, etc., of unknown true blood pressures, 
and for each theta i, a single observation xi that goes with it. If one takes the Bayesian approach and regards the successive theta i's as coming from some arbitrary but fixed prior distribution, then the posterior distribution of theta i given the single xi will depend strongly on the prior, and this dependence will in no way decrease as successive xi's uh, are observed for different people. The question then occurred to me. Oh, the reason why, uh, why the dependence doesn't decrease is that the prior doesn't change with the observation x. Only the posterior of theta, but not the prior, changes with the observations in the classical Bayesian theory. Anyway, the question then occurred to me, can one, from the successive xi's, from different persons, each with a different theta i, but all of which have the same uh, prior, assumed prior, can one arrive at a more and more accurate estimate of the true prior? You see, I'm distinguishing between the assumed prior and the true prior, a distinction which doesn't occur in, in uh, Bayesian theory. Anyway, if so, one could use these assumed successively estimated, excuse me, not, these successively estimated priors to greater and greater effect as more and more observations xi became available instead of keeping one's original prior forever, whatever the evidence of the x's. This would meet the objections of the non-Bayesians to the arbitrary or personal choice of a prior and at the same time preserve the superior performance of the Bayesian analysis to mere admissibility or minimaxity of the non-Bayesian approach. In the Bayesian literature that I had seen, this question did not arise since a prior distribution for a statistical parameter theta was supposed either to come from personal introspection or to be chosen for its mathematical convenience. I asked myself, could one be an empirical Bayesian, perhaps starting with a strongly or weakly held initial prior, but then modifying it to reflect the accumulation of evidence provided by not the unobservable theta i's, but the observable x i's. As an extreme instance, could one let one's estimate of the true prior of theta from some population be completely determined by successive observation, observations xi on a succession of people chosen at random from that population, assuming only that the xi varies in some specified way about the corresponding theta i. Perhaps it would not even be necessary to restrict the initial prior to a specified parametric family. As with any idea, a new idea, one likes to push it to an extreme, if only to discover its weak points and at the same time to have the pleasure of a pâté les bourgeois. To illustrate, in more detail, the difference between the Bayesian, non-Bayesian, and empirical Bayesian approaches, let me discuss a drastically oversimplified version of this blood pressure problem in an example taken from a paper I contributed to the Second Berkeley Symposium of 1950. And here is the simplified problem. You'll see how much simplified it is. Suppose that a random variable uh, x is assumed to be, again, normally distributed with known variance, one, and with mean theta that is known to be either plus one or minus one. From a single observation on x, we are required to decide whether theta is plus or minus one, the penalty for error being assumed to be the same in either case. Now, this is the terribly simple problem that I want you to think about to start with. X is normal, mean plus or minus one, variance one. All you have to do is to look at an observed, single observed value of X and decide is the theta that produced it, that produced the X, plus one or minus one. 
Well, if you think about it pictorially, you'll see here's a normal distribution with mean plus one, here's a normal distribution with mean minus one. And obviously, if x is very large, you, you probably guess it comes from the plus one. If x is very negative, you probably assume it comes from the minus one. So it's intuitively obvious, and it can be proved rigorously, that the only decision procedures that we need to consider, the so-called admissible ones for this simple problem, are those for which, if x is greater than c, we decide that theta is plus one. If x is less than c, we decide that theta is minus one, where c is some chosen constant, positive, negative, or zero. By symmetry, it might seem that we should simply choose c equal to zero and decide that theta is plus one if, when x is greater than zero and theta is minus one when x is less than zero. However, the two values of theta, plus and minus one, might well occur in, in practice with different frequencies. And the overall probability of error, which is what we want to minimize, will depend on these frequencies as well as on our choice of c. If we denote by p the prior probability that theta equals plus one, so that q equal to one minus p is the prior probability that theta equals minus one, then the prior distribution of theta in this absurdly simple case is completely determined by the value of p because we know that theta is plus or minus one. The only question is what is the probability that it's plus one and one minus that, that it's minus one. So p is the whole prior, the value of p determines the whole prior. And the overall probability of error in using a cutoff point c for deciding whether theta is plus or minus one is given is a function of c and of p. And I'll tell you what the function is in words, since I, I can't put it on the blackboard. Uh, in words, the probability of error for a given choice of c and for a given value of p is the prior probability that theta is plus one times the probability of error when theta equals plus one. Error meaning uh, that x should be less than c, which is when we're going to say that theta is minus one plus the prior probability that theta equals minus one times the probability of error to wit that x is greater than c given that theta is minus one. And if you work this out mathematically with the assumption of normal distribution, unit variance, turns out that this, this function of c and p, uh, which we call the risk function, uh, is given by the formula p times capital phi of c minus one plus one minus p times capital phi of minus c minus one, where a capital phi of anything is the Gaussian error function, the area under a standard normal curve from minus infinity to the argument of the function. By the symmetry of the situation, or by substitution in the, in the mathematical formula, we see that for c equal to zero, the risk function is p times capital phi simply of minus one plus q times capital phi of minus one also, which is simply phi of minus one, which has the numerical value of 0.1587, no matter what p is. So for any choice of the cutoff point c diff different from zero, uh, although the risk function will vary with p, well, let me go back. For any choice of c different from zero, the risk function will vary with p, but its maximum over all p will exceed 1.1587, whereas for c equals zero, it will be flat and equal to 0.1587 for all p. Now the question is, in view of all these facts, how should we choose c? Suppose first that the value of p, the prior probability that theta equals plus one, Suppose this is known to us. I use the word known, so to speak, in quotations because it's not a mathematical term. But suppose we're absolutely certain we know P. This is the Bayesian case. The prior is known. We can then choose the value of C, which minimizes the risk function, R of C and P, for the known P. And this value of C is found by some elementary mathematics to be given by the formula one half log of one minus p over p. When p is greater than one half, this quantity is negative. When p is less than a half, it's positive. When p equals one half, it's zero. 
When we use this value of the constant in our decision procedure, the overall probability of error will be the risk function for this constant, of, uh, which depends on p and of p, which then becomes a function only of p. And it's called the so-called, and it's, it's a so-called Bayes risk function. And it represents the best we can do when we know p exactly. Now, by reference to tables of the normal distribution, we can evaluate the risk function r of p uh, exactly. And we find an arch-shaped curve rising from zero when p equals zero to a maximum of 0.1587 when p equals one half, and then going back down again to zero as p tends to one. For example, uh, the risk function at p equals 0.1 has risen from zero to 0.072. At p equals 0.2, the risk function has risen to 0.112. Keeps on going up until we get to P equals one half when, as I said, it reaches its maximum of 1587. Then it goes down symmetrically as we keep on going. Now let's summarize all this. It's not necessary to, to see the formula to get an idea of what's going on. There are two obvious possibilities. One, if we choose C equal to the optimal value the Bayesian value, which I said before, to it, one half log of one minus p over p, where p is the true prior probability, that theta is one, the risk will be r of p, and that's gonna be less than 0.1587, except when p equals one half, when it will be equal to it. But this will be the nature of the risk function. If we're lucky and we know p, we'll find that p is not right in the middle, but a little bit to one side or another. And by using the Bayesian value of the cutoff point, we'll be able to get a risk less than 0.1587, maybe quite a lot less. And that is the Bayesian choice and the Bayesian solution to the problem. And that's the end of it from the Bayesian point of view because I'm using the word Bayesian in a somewhat extreme sense. Bayesian is somebody who knows prior. Now the other situation is we don't have any idea of what P is. Well, we have no idea what P is. One thing we can do is, so to speak, prepare ourselves for the worst that can happen. This is a somewhat paranoid uh, attitude to it. You, you figure that whatever I do, nature will see to it that the worst possible choice of P is, is gonna be made. But I can protect myself by choosing C equal to zero, the so-called minimax choice. Because when C equals zero, the risk is always 0.1587. Whereas if I'd chosen C to be anything other than zero, the risk goes up and down, and the up part for either P near zero or P near one uh, is gonna be bigger than 0.1587. So there are, there are two possibilities, two extreme possibilities, a complete assurance that we know P or complete ignorance about P, which lead respectively to the Bayesian or the Minimax uh, way of, of handling this problem. And I really can't see there's much more that a statistician can say about it. Now, there's one other possibility, of course, and that is you can make a guess about P and use the optimal value of the cutoff point that would be correct if you knew P, but in fact, the true value of P is not your assumed one. And then you're gonna be in a somewhat debatable situation. You, you don't quite know what's gonna happen. Well, uh, what to do? Uh, as my mother used to say, quote, homines tot sententiae. As many men, as many opinions. So let us broaden the discussion if you can't solve a problem, generalize it. So now for empirical base. Statistical problems of the same nature often occur in large batches. Recall the medical teams who are trying to estimate everybody's true blood pressure 
from a single observation. For the simpler problem just considered, but it's of the same nature, where the theta, the true value, is, supposed, is assumed always to be plus or minus one, let's suppose that we have a, a sequence of independent pairs of random variables. Theta one, x one, that's on the first person. True blood pressure, theta one, observed blood pressure, x one. Second person, theta two, x two, theta three, x three, et cetera. These are independent random pairs with the following two assumptions. Each theta i is plus or minus one with respective probabilities pq, the same for each i. In other words, I'm assuming that the people are chosen from some population and the proportion of plus ones is p in that population and minus ones, one minus p, q. So p is assumed the same for each i. And the second is that given theta i, xi is normal with mean theta i and variance one. For n equals one, this is just the simple decision problem that we previously considered. Now, since the probability distribution of xi, according to what I just said, depends only on theta i, the values of the xj for j different from i are independent of theta i and hence contain no information about it. Whatever that means. Seems self-evident that the problem involving theta 1 x1, theta 2 x2, etc resolves itself, therefore, into the n individual problems of the type previously considered to it, that we should say that theta i equals plus one if x i is greater than c, theta i equals minus one if x i is less than c, where the choice of c is either the optimal Bayes choice, c sub p, so to speak, if we know p, or maybe zero if we don't. So there is no particular gain in assuming a, a large number of independent instances of this problem. But, and the word but is in capital letters, although the xj for j different from i contain no information about theta i, they contain a lot of information about p to it, the prior distribution of theta. In fact, the expectation of, theta, uh, of xi given theta i is by assumption theta i, because xi was assumed to be normal, mean theta i, and p was assumed to equal, and theta was supposed to equal plus one or minus one with probability p or one minus p, so e of xi is simply e of theta i, which is equal to p minus q or two p minus one. Well, if e of xi is 2p minus 1, then e of xi plus 1 over 2 is p. We've got, in other words, xi plus 1 over 2 is an unbiased estimate of p. Of course, the variance of it is appreciable. A calculation shows that the variance may be as much as uh, 1 half, depending on p. But if we take the abs, uh, if we take the average x bar to it, the 1 over n times the sum of x1, x2 to xn, then this will also be unbiased. E of x bar plus 1 over 2 again equals p. But now the variance of x bar plus 1 over 2 is less than 1 over 2n. And for a large n, that means that this estimate of p will be almost certainly very close to the true but unknown value. In fact, we can truncate the estimate, which may spill a little bit over to the negative or greater than one side by just chopping it off there. And then we'll have an estimate which is also between zero and one, like p, and will be very accurate for a large n. Now, what we, that suggests is to use the decision rule. Decide that theta i is plus one if x i is greater than c star and C star is the Bayesian rule with P replaced by our estimate to it 
C star is one half log of one minus P star over P star. P star being the thing I just described, essentially uh, X bar plus one over two, properly truncated. Even though this violates the intuitive notion that the decision on theta i should, I put quotes around it, depend only on x i. Now, in fact, it should indeed, in the sense that if we knew p, it'd be better if we use c sub p. But if we don't know p, using c sub p star may be better than using a wrong guess about p or using zero for c. In fact, we can prove that with this empirical Bayes estimate of p, the probability of error on any one of our batch of problems approaches uniformly the Bayes risk r of p, whatever p might be. In other words, our risk is going to be very much the same, uh, this arched curve. Uh, if P is near half, the risk will be about 0.1587. But if P is not near half, it'll be uh, near R of P, which comes down quickly to be less. Oh. Now, to make all this more appealing to non-Bayesians, who don't even like to assume the existence of P, I reformulated things in a non-Bayesian way. And this is a, just a trivial uh, change. Let's suppose that instead of theta 1, x1, theta 2, x2 being independent with theta and x both random vary, randomly varying, suppose that the thetas are simply a string of unknown constants. Each, each of them is plus or minus 1. And now the x's are independent normal variables, xn being normal uh, with mean theta n. Uh, and variance one. Here, what is unknown is not p. It's not the probability that the theta is equal uh, one, because there isn't any such. It's simply the whole vector, theta one, theta two, theta n. And there are two to the nth power such vectors. Now, using exactly the same decision function, this, this p star thing that I mentioned before, it is easily seen that if we use this on n such problems, that the average probability of error on the n problems again approaches the function r, the risk function, of p of theta. p of theta now being the proportion of ones in the vector theta, rather than the a priori probability that theta equals one. So for large n, we can average about as few errors in the n decisions as if we knew exactly how many thetas were plus one and how many were minus one, but not which was which. The two formulations that I've just mentioned are very similar mathematically, although the practical interpretation uh, of, of what we're doing here may uh, make one of the other interpretations seem more, more natural in any given case. To shock people into realizing that in this latter formulation, no connection between the component problems was being assumed, I said in the 1950 paper, quote, X1 could be an observation on a butterfly in Ecuador, X2 on an oyster in Maryland, X3 the temperature of a star, and so on. Well, this was a bit too much for some people who in the discussion of a paper by J.B. Kopas in the uh, JRSS Series B, 1969, uh, described the, 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 uh, the butterfly in London, the oyster in Maryland, et cetera, approach as a, quote, non-starter, which I believe is a British phrase for some uh, horse race in which the horse in question didn't turn up. Even the original uh, empirical Bayes approach, where presumably all these problems are more or less the same, not involving stars, oysters, and butterflies, but all, let's say, sick people, even that approach was anathema, and I use the religious term advisedly, to extreme Bayesians. 
who since they always know P to start with, have no desire and no way to change their minds as data come in. As D.V. Lindley observed in the Copus paper that I referred to, quote, there is no one less Bayesian than an empirical Bayesian. And I was trying to be Bayesian. Anyway. Nowadays, it seems that everyone is an empirical Bayesian of some sort. Even I have returned to the idea in some, in some current work on the possibility of designing clinical trials to compare the effect on sick people of a new drug with that of a placebo without using a control group of sick people who are given the placebo. I foresee the same amount of difficulty in gaining general acceptance of this work that the empirical Bayes theory had during the 50s and 60s, when only some of my own students, Jim Hannon, Vernon Johns, Richard Krechkoff, Esther Samuel, and others, took it seriously. Even my suggested name for it, quote, an attempt to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps, has been appropriated by another procedure. I've not had time to discuss uh, the second paper I wrote on, well, the third paper, actually, on it uh, in the third Berkeley Symposium in 1955, where I introduced the empirical Bayes terminology. I, will, I want to mention that there is a reference there in the third Berkeley Symposium paper to a 1942 paper by Richard von Mises, which was published in the Annals of Mathematical Statistics. And the paper by von Mises is the, only, is the only historical antecedent of anything like the empirical Bayes approach that I knew then. Recently, however, the Italian statistician Forcini, Forcini has said that Corrado Gini anticipated the, the empirical Bayes idea in 1911. Forcini's paper is in the International Statistical Review for 1982 but I have not been able to confirm his thesis by, by reading the Genie paper. I wish that some historian of statistical thought would look into the history of the empirical Bayes idea, while some of us, like Charles Stein and myself, who are in on the beginning, are still around to contribute their old men's unreliable memories of how it all started. There's, of course, still much to be done in empirical Bayes theory, and I do not mean only better ways to handle large data sets with supercomputers. Current work in the field seems to be dominated by the Efron Morris approach of assuming that the unknown priors of some specified parametric form, so that only one or two parameters have to be estimated and not the general form of the prior. Personally, I prefer a less parametric formulation, partly because it leads to more interesting mathematics, which is, of course, not a statistical virtue. Some good references to the empirical Bayes literature are given on pages three to five of the Herbert Robbins Selected Papers volume, edited by T.L. Lai and uh, D.O. Sigmund, published by Springer Verlag in 1985, which also reprints some of my own contributions to the subject as of that date. Am I personally an empirical Bayesian? I don't know. When people ask me why I became a statistician, I answered that I always had a good head for figures, but I felt that I lacked the charisma to be a successful accountant. <laughs> this seems to be a good place to stop. This concludes our 10th Pfizer Colloquium.